Excellent. We're going to continue to explore the, the world of investment. We had on stage this morning two managing partners of And Ventures, Lee Moser, and I think you can all see that she has just something very, very special to give to the, to the venture capital uh, world and also uh, the world of entrepreneurs, as well as Tal, uh, the managing partner of Spice VC, who's doing um, phenomenally well with 270% return so far on Spice VC1. I'm really pleased to introduce you to our next speaker, who um, has had very big jobs at Google. He's a, a very special guy. Lee and Roy are storming the early stage venture capital market right now with far implications, far beyond just Israel and so forth. Um, Roy's going to share with you his his concept for the studio model and how um, how that really is going to unlock value both for the entrepreneurs as well as the investors in venture capital. Um, I would like to invite you to please welcome Roy Glasberg to the stage. Roy. Uh, so hello, everybody. Um, I need to keep up with uh, my partner who spoke here before, and uh, it's a tough challenge, so I'll try to manage. Um, so my name is Roy. Um, I'll try to do a painless as possible introduction of my background so you can understand kind of uh, where I'm coming from. Uh, so. Um, as everybody in Israel went through the military service, intelligence corps, then I moved to the secret service where I was doing mostly uh, embassy securities around the world. Uh, then I did uh, four degrees in university. I always say I need to learn everything twice to really get it. So I did uh, my uh, MBA in business and finance, then law, uh, then master's in law specializing in IP, and then financial engineering. In my career, I've been working with early stage startups for about 20 years now. Uh, starting as a lawyer, helping early stage companies basically uh, with the foundation of their companies from the legal perspective. Uh, then I moved to strategy consulting, working for Hay Group and Deloitte, uh, which was an amazing school of strategy and go-to-market and understanding different industries. Uh, then I moved to Microsoft, where I was uh, building their ecosystem in Israel for startups and integrators, basically leveraging uh, Microsoft's technology uh, into the market. Uh, then live person, doing the same on a European level. And probably the most significant part of, uh, of uh, my career was the six years of the amazing opportunity I got uh, to be the founder of basically what is today Google's accelerators and, and startup programs around the world. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, after. So I'm going to be talking to you today about early stage investing um, and why we see an opportunity for disruption. Um, basically, if, if you look at early stage investing, um, and the early stage founders, uh, that whole ecosystem has been revolutionized in the last 10 years uh, from every aspect, from valuations through the speed of development. Obviously, cloud technologies and others have helped sped, speed sorry, that process. But on top of that, the needs of the founders are ever changing and the way you structure deals and support them has already changed as well. On the flip side, you have the whole ecosystem of investment around early stage um, and sadly, unhappily to say, uh, that side of the equation has not evolved fast enough to adapt to the needs of these early stage founders, why we see that as an opportunity for disruption. If you think about it, you all come from a lot of industries, some of them are very mature industries, all of them have been and will be disrupted in the next couple of years. So my job in this conversation today is to get you excited about what I'm excited about, which is early stage investing. We'll measure it uh, six and 12 months from now to see how many of you become early adopters of, of the platform. Uh, but beyond just early stage investing um, is understanding that beautiful value of having access today to the technologies that are gonna change all of our industries and all of our businesses in the following years. So we, see ourselves as a studio-based fund. What does that mean? It means that we don't just invest and don't not just help companies grow. We want to be almost like a co-founder in the companies that we work with. It's not just about being a board member and it's not just about answering the phone to give guidance. It's helping the early stage entrepreneurs manage their day-to-day -day with all of these challenges and, and all of the um, opportunities that they have. So we're really part of that journey with them which gives us an amazing opportunity to also learn and not just support our portfolio companies. 
So making a difference is probably the key for us. And when I speak about the studio, and I'll elaborate a little bit more later about the, the model of the studio, but the studio for us at end serves two functions. The first function is obviously a never-ending support platform for our founders. Now, at every stage in every company, uh, it's very easy to identify between the very successful professional founders, and, and one of them is gonna be talking after me, um, because they're open to the help and support that they know they will need. Unlike certain founders that, you know, will probably won't be a good fit for us at hand uh, because they're not open for that support and that level of involvement, which I think uh, is a mistake. I can look at 20 years of career um, and it has always been dependent on the kind of people I had around me that were able to support me in the different, different efforts that I was going through. So the studio, on the one hand, is the support mechanism for our portfolio companies. But on the other hand, it's also the learning university for us as partners to continuously learn what are the challenges of founders. What are the new technologies and new ways of developing products, getting them to the market? What are the different strategies uh, that are needed? And it's a never-ending learning process for us to make sure that we're not just investors, we're actually learning from our founders on a daily basis what is needed to be a successful founder, and that's an amazing opportunity for us to learn. Uh, a little bit about startup economics. I'm sure, uh, I promise you I'm not gonna go uh, too deep into that. Uh, but at the end of the day, when you come in early um, and you see the, the, the companies from formation through the beginning of their growth, that's where you have the maximum potential of, of gains from that investment. That's where the multipliers are going to look serious and look sometimes ridiculous. That's where you really have the essence and opportunity to be involved and learn about what are the new technologies coming to market and at the same time capitalize on your investment. At the same time, as we all know, there's no free money in the world, and when you do early stage investing, you have to take under consideration that the chances of these companies shutting down is much higher than when you invest in companies that already have uh, customers, sales, and validated technology. So how do you do risk? How do you come in where it's obviously exciting and profitable to be in, but at the same time not finding yourself using the very common strategy in the venture world, which is invest in a lot and hope that one or two of these companies is actually gonna be successful and deliver on the value. On top of that, if you look at the early, st early stage ecosystem, the early stage ecosystem suffers from our perspective uh, from a couple of challenges that I'll, I'll share with you today. So the one is the deal flow challenge. Israel is an amazing startup ecosystem. We talked before about the, the military training uh, but it's not just the military training, it's the attitude, is the early adoption of any technology out there. When I worked for Google, my job, in the beginning at least, was to educate developers on Android and Chrome and what's coming from Google. And I had the easiest job because the developers in Israel knew before me what was coming out and they were already trained on it when I got to the, you know, to the talk room and tried to go over it. But how do you get to the high quality deal flow where everybody is competing on it that's a big challenge. The second challenge is we're dealing with early stage. We, we still have the whole journey of validation, design partnership, making sure that the vision of the founder is actually becoming a product people want to use and people want to buy. So how do you validate very, very early and make sure that one, the technology is feasible, two, applicable, and three, that the team and the knowledge behind it will be there to sustain a company and not a startup. And I always like to tease when I ask an audience of people, how many of you are, are working on startups and everybody raised their hands? And I always say that's the wrong thing to work on. You're working on building companies. You wanna see the success at the end. You wanna see something that's sustained, that is really built to last. Another challenge that you have is, and this has become a very common topic, is what's value add investing? Money is not king, and, and we'll talk a lot about that as well. But what is the added value you bring as an investor that can really support your companies? And how much do you put that as your core value, and we talked about values before, versus this is an additional layer because everybody says they're value-add investors, so I'm gonna say I'm a value-add investor as well. That definition doesn't work anymore. It has to be something way more sustainable 
uh, if you really want to be successful in early stage investing, we'll talk about that. And last but not least is, you all know what's the biggest advantage of the Israeli market, right? There is no market. So every company in Israel that's building a technology is already thinking about going global from day one, otherwise there'll be nobody to sell to, which is a huge advantage in comparison with other markets that I work with around the world. But how do we speed up that process of amazing tech people, amazing product people with a great concept to getting them to scale? Lee mentioned before that our biggest strategy and our biggest belief is in product-led growth, but that's a whole specialization that you need to have from the right personnel and the right knowledge and the right methodology to help these companies scale into international markets, which is where it's relevant. Some more, the, uh, some more challenges that we see, um, is, as I've said, you know, it, it's, it's competing on a deal flow in, in a hyper, hyper evolved ecosystem uh, where valuations are nuts, um, where the founders are basically managing a CRM of all the investors and giving them score at the end of the meeting and then deciding which investor they're gonna take money from. That's the reality we are working on today. The, the second challenge that you have is serial and experienced entrepreneurs, which, you know, Lee talked before about the 40 unicorns coming out of Israel in the last year and a half. Well, if you look at the last 10 years, uh, these founders, successful founders, become one of two things. Either they start a new company or they become investors. How do you have access to these people and how are you relevant for these people is a challenge. I, I got the uh, beautiful opportunity of, of meeting a few serial entrepreneurs that once they finished preparing their first PowerPoint, um, they got six and million dollar, six or eight million dollar offering for, for investment in their companies. And there is no company and there's nothing there, it's just a PowerPoint. So that's a crazy ecosystem in which we live in, where on top of that, all these founders have already raised money. They've already built companies. So they're not gonna be out there. They're not you know, going with a sign in the street, I need to raise money. So in a lot of the cases, the time you're gonna hear about these guys building companies is gonna be when they're already funded and when they're already out. And that LinkedIn title of stealth mode is becoming more and more common. So how do you find yourself really working with the best of the best and bringing them to the table as a challenge? Uh, Lee mentioned it, and I'll, and I'll elaborate a little bit more about that as well, is, is the time to make a decision on investment in a hyper competitive and hyper fast market. So we get uh, a lot of the opportunities that we see we have founders coming to us uh, with term sheets. We have founders coming to us with, with already existing offers to invest in them. And we don't have the months that we were accustomed to in the past of doing the due diligence, going through the process. And we are a heavy, heavy fund when it comes to due diligence. We will not invest in a company before we had matter experts, industry experts, professionals from every aspect of the company actually help us validate that that company is worth investing in. So how do you compete with that speed? And last but not least is the importance, the super, super, super critical importance of design partners when you're building a product. And I always tell founders that the first deck that they build is the last deck that they're gonna build. From now on, their offering, the product, the features is gonna be defined by the users. So any smart entrepreneur, and as I've said, one of them is gonna talk after me, uh, knows that the faster they will reach these design partners and potential customers, the faster they will be able to develop a product that actually makes sense and people actually need it. With obviously being prepared for failure, which is a great way to learn and improve and come back with a new version and iterate. So if you look today at that mismatch that I talked to you about between early stage investors, at least the traditional ones, and, and, and long-term investors, um, I already hinted to the difference. It's the long-term thinking and focus. When you're doing early stage investments, the best way to avoid the need for a whole support mechanism is just spread small checks in a lot of companies and hoping that one of them will prevail. Um, so that's kind of the, I would say, the biggest differentiator if you look at incubators, accelerators, angel investors, while on the VC side, we have another problem. We have VCs that have a checklist. And if you want to raise money from a VC, you have to show that uh, you built an amazing team. You have to show that your product is validated somehow by a couple of customers. They want to see traction. They want to see revenue coming in. 
So that is that area where we believe that, a, that early stage founders need a lot more support and a lot more adaptation of the investment model into what actually should work today. And that's the disruption that we're talking about and we're trying to bring to the, to the table. Um, as somebody who ran accelerators for many, many, many years, uh, that has become a very common model for early stage founders, especially first time founders, to get the training and education and support. But again, accelerators today are less popular with founders who are either very successful or think they will be very successful. We have to manage both in Israel. Uh, but at the same time, they're not getting the right, or I would say the best deal flow coming into these accelerators. Some of these funding, funding structures of accelerators uh, provide a very, I would say, low valuation to the companies coming into these accelerators. And at the end of the day, an accelerator, as sophisticated as it would be, is a real estate business. I have 20 seats for six months, and I need to clear those seats as, as fast as I can so I get the other uh, startups coming into the program and so on and so forth. There's no long-term vision and long-term commitment of me really supporting these companies for the next four or five years. So when we're talking about de-risking, we have to look at what are the reasons that early stage founders fail. So on the one hand, it's the team. And are they structuring the right team? Is the dynamics between the founders the right dynamics to be successful? On top of that is the idea, and I would say the gap between idea to product market fit, between the idea and the actual validation that companies are going to give uh, these founders. Funding, uh, although it's, I would say there's way more, fund, way more money available in Israel today than there is talent to actually absorb it, uh, still, companies have challenge in their cycle of funding of how fast can they raise and how do they adapt to that speed of growing a product and presenting the right value to investors so they don't lose a lot of the equity along the way as they build their companies until they're diluted to death. And you ask yourself, why the hell is this founder still in that company when they own, I don't know, 5 or 10% of it? Obviously, the business models, and this is where I'm going to kind of speak differently about one of the concepts that was mentioned early in the morning. Corporates are critical, companies are critical to how startups build their products today. I think there is a huge gap between what corporates do and how they manage their innovation strategy and how startups fit into that formula. But that doesn't mean that having access tomorrow to Citi's Bank, Citibank's data is not a huge advantage for a fintech startup building their machine learning on top of it. And that's just one example of a billion we can give from knowing the market, knowing the users, having access to data, which is so critical for companies. And last but not least is obviously the timing. How do I build myself as a company um, strong enough so we've all been surprised by COVID, uh, but there are a lot of surprises in the market. And there's down times and there's up times. How do we build something that is sustainable, that even if the adoption rate is not as fast as we want it to be today, we're built to last so uh, you know, we can, we can adjust to the cycles. So the ideal solution, at least from our perspective, um, is really the ability to engage with these founders when they need help the most. And what we've learned is that both serial entrepreneurs and first-time entrepreneurs, the first six to eight months are super critical for how they build and validate the team. I had the opportunity of working with a serial entrepreneur um, who came to me and said, hey, I've got an amazing PowerPoint, amazing idea, I've already hired a CTO, um, and we have uh, a fund, an American fund, giving us $8 million as a preliminary investment. My, my automatic reaction was, you know, I'm out of the game, but I'm happy to help you at least with the validation and learn from you uh, through the process. Uh, within two weeks, um, we both had very strong feedback on the team and on the product and the relevance of that product, so we saved that founder basically building a company that most chances are wasn't going to work. That's the critical time where we need to be in and have the right expertise and the right network around us to support these companies. The second thing is, and, and we love to say that at end, is leave the funding. I, I would say that CEOs of startups spend a lot of time on fundraising and now it's becoming shorter and shorter periods of time. And they should be working on their product and they should make their customers happy and they should bring the right values and skills into their team. That's what they should be doing. 
So a lot of the opportunities you have from coming in early is really helping the founders secure, build their funding strategy. And as I'll talk later about that combination of studio and fund, you can really do it for the long term and really support them where they have, in some cases, less uh, experience in doing, but at the same time keeps their energy focused on what they should be focusing on. Last but not least is what I talked about before is that validation and how do you help these companies and these products and these founders get as fast as they can, not just to general customers, but to the customers that we've built a relationship with that are early adapters, that are willing to have their team and time spent on helping these startups develop their product market fit. And that is super, super critical in the process. You're going to have a lot of corporates working with startups saying, hey, we'd love to work with you. That's great. Um, you know, let's schedule a meeting for next quarter. Uh, we have end of the year plans, so let's talk in February. And that's not the pace that startups work. They need that validation quicker so they can iterate and build the right product. This is where the studio comes in. And the studio, at the end of the day, has, I would say, three main pillars in order to be successful. On the one hand is obviously the ecosystem you have around it, serial entrepreneurs, experienced entrepreneurs. Uh, we currently work with one of the leading universities in Israel with their alumni, uh, with the plan of basically expanding to all leading universities in Israel. Uh, but beyond that, it's that network that you have that people know you are a home to come to when I have an idea and not what I said before, that I've already checked all the boxes and I'm ready for investment. So it's important to be there and important to be a home for these ideas. Second is create an efficient process, and we'll talk about that as well. How do I make sure that companies coming in get the right support at every stage? And that's a never-ending process because the challenges change, because products change, technologies change. How do you make sure that you're always adaptive uh, to what's happening? And obviously, getting to where we all want to get with our investments and with our founders is how to build their success. And I always, always, always make fun of my founders and I say, I hope you'll answer my calls in three, four years time uh, when you guys are already successful and you exploded and you, you know, have a huge clientele and, and, and revenue stream coming into the company. How do you build them towards that? And there's a huge difference between two founders with a great idea when they come to you on day one and when a company now needs to build its customer success team and the support team and the tech team and the development to scale so this company can actually absorb those opportunities that will help them get. So that's the whole, I would say, 40,000 feet concept of how a studio works. How we leverage that? We leverage that into, as I said, the validation. For us, it's about eight to 10 people looking at every company that we consider investing in. Um, and obviously working as an ecosystem, so we invite our mentors and we invite our professionals to actually be involved in the deal, sometimes take a position in the company, sometimes invest in it. We want to make sure that every founder that comes to us has access to talent and knowledge they would not get normally. The second thing that we do is very deep assessment. What is the product UX tech needs of today and how are they building uh, their platform so when they start scaling, they don't have to look back and say our architecture is, is not there. Or when you talk about user experience, how do we make sure that what Silicon Valley is training us on the new, new standards for user experience, how do we make sure that they're aiming for that? Because at the end of the day, um, you can't really expect your users to accept a lower standard of the experience and the journey they get with other products. So how do you adapt that? Technology, I spoke about the infrastructure and how you built yourself for growth. From the people perspective, are they the right people to be there? Is that the right team? What's the dynamics between them and these are the people we're going to be working with for the next six to eight years to really build the company? Once we answer these two questions, we go to actually building those companies and executing on our investment and executing on basically becoming their co-founders for the next couple of years until, as I've said, they're successful and probably drop us off the phone. The venture build building process of a studio is utilizing resources. This is something that I've learned from Google X back in the day. Um, so, when you have a factory of ideas, not all of them are going to be successful. And not every company that you came in and not every team that you're bringing in is going to be successful. How do you make sure that the learning stays? How do you make sure that, okay, maybe you weren't successful here, stay in the system, continue working with us so when there's another opportunity, we can drop you in because maybe there your skill set is going to be better than it was before. Maybe your idea, and, and we just, you know, um, talked about RVM and, and, and 
being complementary, how, when you have an ecosystem, do you combine solutions, combine ideas, and combine learning to make sure that this, there is a minimal waste of resources as you go through this very elaborated process of building companies? Also, when you look at uh, studios versus other models that you have in the market, then I think the biggest advantage of a studio is that it's built like a startup, and we're built like a startup. We have a CTO, we have a head of product, we had a head of, head, head of, head of growth on our team, we have a, a finance specialist, we have an analyst on the team. We, we built ourselves as a startup. And when you're built as a startup, your ability to touch the different aspects that I mentioned before is the main reasons of why startups fail, uh, just increases your chances to identify challenges ahead of time and to continuously help and support as a team that's building companies together. And then the beauty of it comes when you're looking at the combination of a studio and a VC and a venture capital. This is where, as you can see on top, you've got the startup studio, which is basically from day zero until you get to scale. But if you combine that with the VC cycle, then you really can capitalize on investments for the long term. And that's where the beauty of, of these models come to a disruptive form of really being impactful and delivering the results that we want to deliver to our investors. Also, when you look at studios and you look kind of the performance levels, the time to market, the time to exit, the chances of exit, everything changes when you look at the data coming from studios around the world versus the traditional way of building companies. That doesn't mean that this formula is now something we can copy paste and put on our future results because the market changes. Even when we're building the Ant Studio, it's very different from studios that you'll see out there because we always have to evolve and change. But as you can see, that deep involvement and the professional team working behind these founders really increases their chances of success, delivering astonishing results if you look historically versus basically spraying and, pr spraying and praying to that you know, one of my portfolio companies will be successful. So we, we run basically four parts at end to make this successful. One is the studio, where the core team that drives the studio that is able to build and support companies. We have a network behind us of EARs. We have a network behind us of successful founders who built companies in the past and corporate professionals. They all work with us on that validation and building the plans for how our company builder is gonna support these companies going forward. And last but not least, we invest a lot through our relationships, through our investors, through our network to build those landing pads and easy access, access to markets around the world and to corporates around the world. That's how you complete that picture to create an early stage growth house, which is what we aim to do. And then for early stage investors, this is not just for us, it's important to understand that, yes, this is probably the riskiest part of investments when you look at a startup world. It's also very profitable if you do it right. But the times of being an investor and expecting people to chase me for the money doesn't exist anymore. The time of startups coming to me without having something to prove that I can provide as value is not relevant anymore. So I don't want to discourage you from working with early stage startups. It's just understanding that times have changed. The product that we offer as investors have to evolve and we really need to think about what the user needs, what the startup needs in every stage of the way, instead of how quickly can we deploy money and move to the next opportunity that we have. So I joined Google seven years ago. Um, and I joined Google, um, as I told you, um, as developer relations, teaching uh, entrepreneurs how to work on Chrome, how to work on Android. I really didn't have a job at Israel at the time because they were all doing it better than I did. And then realized that there was something missing in Google's go-to-market approach with startups. And I was lucky enough that I was sitting in Israel with very minimal to no supervision uh, to just explode and experiment. Basically, Google is a company of scale, and that's, that's how Google was so successful. They're thinking about the tens of thousands, the hundreds of thousands that will get on an online platform and engage with. So there was a lot of resistance when this guy from Israel said, hey, we should work with the individual startup, that'll be a better learning opportunity for us, and also the ability to build success stories and methodology of how we work with startups. Six years later, I was lucky enough to um, basically start in Israel with accelerators, scale the program to 40 countries around the world, that wasn't enough, build an accelerator in San Francisco, uh, scale that to 40 countries, but that wasn't enough, and then we started opening 
different hubs around the world of supporting from Lagos, which was our first launch internationally, through Sao Paulo, through Mexico City, through Singapore, through Tokyo, 14 of those, where each one of them required a different um, market approach because the needs of startups in Lagos was very different from startups in Tokyo and definitely different from startups in Mexico City. But seeing that was an amazing opportunity to basically experiment and build a structure or a program or a product that can work. Then realizing that accelerators are not very effective, we've launched the first machine learning studio or AI studio for Google, which enabled us to work with the individual company, understand their needs, give them the right support at the right time, and eventually learn from them. And if there's one thing that defines our business is we need and want to learn from our founders. What they know is always going to be superior to what we know. If you want to learn about innovation, you want to see how markets are going to be transformed, you want to see how opportunities arise, you have to be there in a listening mode. And that, I think, is the most beautiful thing about what we do at AND and what we do in general as investors, and that's why I really hope I convince at least some of you to get more involved in early stage investing, which I believe is fascinating and interesting. Thank you. Let me, let's, let me give you a couple of questions before um, we invite uh, in, you. In the, in the penal box? Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, without falling. Neither one of us are going to fall. Um, that was fantastic. And really, the expertise that you bring in thinking um, about how to scale companies is, is really, really interesting and fascinating. Um, we're we're going to have time for questions uh, from the audience to get your questions ready. But, um, you know, what's been the, you know, Lee shared this morning a, a couple of the early moments of your, of your platform and fund happening and so forth. What's been the biggest kind of change to what you thought it was going to be to AND? What, what's, what's been surprising about this compared to all of the different things that you saw with Google, with AND, what you thought, and where you are now? Great question. Uh, we can probably spend another uh, hour just talking <laughs> about that one. Uh, but when, when I left Google, I had, uh, I had a, a vision and a dream of supporting startups at the level of what we could do. Google understanding that without the Google platform and Google logo, it's going to be way harder uh, and more complex to do. So the first surprise I had coming to Israel was, you know, aside of, of meeting a partner of a lifetime, was understanding how much of the Israeli ecosystem players are willing to participate, how many technology experts and people are open to spend their time building that support mechanism for early stage founders. So that was kind of the, the first surprise of how that works. I think the second thing is um, when we start investing in as a, as a fund and we're already showing amazing results, far more than we could ever expect uh, from our existing investments, um, we found that actually our users the founders are the best school of what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. I mean, again, I'm pointing to Daniel because I introduced him in a second, but I remember the first meetings I had with Daniel, and I came in a very structured way of how I'm supporting his company, and he was very polite in the first meeting. In the second meeting, he said, listen, actually, we have different needs that are very critical right now, and we need your help in them. The first one was staffing in a market that doesn't have a lot of availability today, how to get to the right professionals around the world to work. So for me, it was going back to the drawing board of, OK, I need to adapt to the needs of my users. So from all of these aspects, including the, fast of, uh, you know, the, the fastness of deals being closing in Israel, mm -hmm. it kind of always puts our model, are we doing enough? Are we fast enough? Are we mm -hmm. good enough? Are mm -hmm. we bringing the right value to the table? Which always puts you as, OK, everything has changed from, uh, from what we thought in the beginning. Now with all of the, um, you mentioned accelerators from Tokyo to Silicon Valley to Israel and so forth, how do you think of a market like Greece when you think, I mean, does it, does it seem small? Does it, does it seem, how, after you've done everything that you did at Google, then how do you actually get back to, okay, right, I'm going to help one company go into this market? Doesn't it seem difficult to just kind of say it's about this first step, it's about that, when, when actually it must be so exciting to just build Google's accelerator program. So I'm, I'm, I'm less, let's put it that way, my objective was never to build a Google program. Okay. My objective was to make the ecosystem in Africa better, to make the ecosystem in Tokyo better, to make the ecosystem in Singapore better. That's why I spent months going to Lagos and going to Tokyo and going to Singapore and really learning the needs, mm -hmm. but also learning the strength. Mm -hmm. 
For instance, when you look at fintech today or logistics today, there are amazing startups coming out of Africa, especially from Lagos, but other places, which are going to disrupt a lot of how we in the mature world are working, but we're not aware of it. When I looked at fintech and healthcare, uh, I've seen amazing companies in Indonesia and in Brazil that are really going to transform these markets because they're not as regulated as the ones we see in the Western world, which means they're going to be much faster to adopt, create scale data, and, and come with, with innovative solutions. So the idea was always to look at the ecosystem. And I think, um, again, I have not spent enough time in Greece to learn the values of this ecosystem, but I will say a word of warning. If you want to be efficient, it's not about the individual startup, it's about the ecosystem you build around it. So how do you connect the universities and the talent with the entrepreneurs, with the money in one place so they're very efficient and not wasting time? And two, um, everywhere on the planet, and I'm sure here as well, you have, you're going to have competing accelerators and competing structures. Mm -hmm. And when, and maybe that's the biggest advantage of the Israeli ecosystem because we are able to play and work with so many investors and so many groups around us that we keep that consolidation of power. And when that consolidation of resources is dispersed, it's very difficult mm -hmm. to create a repeatable or what we call an effective startup ecosystem that knows how to repeatedly build and scale companies. Now, are you doing today what the six-year-old Roy thought he was going to do? Definitely not. Nothing in my life today has anything to do with I wanted to be a lawyer. That's how I went to uh, study law school. Um, I wanted to be a biz dev VP in companies because I thought that's going to be cool and I'm going to have access to markets and work. Mm -hmm. um, nah, I think, I think part of the maturity process is understanding, one, what you're good at, but to what you love to do. And it's not about titles and it's not about positioning or anything. It's about seeing these founders that you work with grateful to how much you help them. And on the flip side is the opportunity to learn from them and continuously learn. I feel like I'm still 20 year old because I have access to so many successful, brilliant founders who come up with ideas that I would never think about. And just learning from them about the markets, the opportunity for disruption and the kind of technologies that they can develop is just a great opportunity for me to continue staying young and learning the whole time. So this is a trick question. Ooh. Who's your customer? The other one was a trick question. Uh, that should take yeah. the box for that one. Who's your customer stroke client? Uh, so we at AND are an ecosystem. Obviously, uh, we have been blessed with some of the most amazing human beings to have as our investors. Um, so investors who are seeing AND as an opportunity to learn with us and to evolve with us is, is a huge factor in our success. On the flip side, it's obviously having founders who had good experience with us who would bring their friends. And another element of this is the professional network that mm -hmm. always needs to grow mm -hmm. and having people trust you because event eventually we're all busy people. Mm -hmm. So imagine a machine learning specialist in Israel saying, hey, I'm going to devote hours to working with Anne on their portfolio. Mm -hmm. That's not something we take for granted and we got to work for them to make them happy as well. So I think these are kind of the three audiences that are most interesting from the end perspective. Okay, and um, uh, can you say how much you've raised? Is that public? Yes, we are approaching, it's obviously not public, but everything here is going to go online. Uh, we've raised close to 50 uh, with the target of... <laughs> Lee, Lee knows the numbers. Uh, we're approaching, we, we, we have a target of getting to around 75, uh, okay. just for the strategy of the fund to being able to okay. take a position and continue it with, with, with most of our portfolio companies. Uh -huh. So two-thirds of the way is done, uh, and hopefully in the next couple of months we're going to close on the remaining sum so we can really, really focus Okay. on building our companies even more and building that mechanism for the studio even more. And, and of the 100% of your LPs, your investors, what percentage of them are entrepreneurs? Half. Yep. Mm -hmm. Half, but uh, even the other half are entrepreneurs. There you go. So you've got people <laughs> who build companies and scale them, uh -huh. and you've got people who built a portfolio of investments, but I see them more as entrepreneurs. Not speaking about anybody specifically right now, but they see themselves as entrepreneurs and how they operate and how they invest and how involved they are, and that's very important for us. Excellent. Questions for Roy? Yes, please. We've got Giannis, and then we have over here, so we'll start with Giannis. Yeah, let's get the mic right behind you, Giannis. So, first of all, maybe a pointless question uh, for the rest of the group. My apologies. But I read in the, in the black book that uh, you are a father of four daughters. Mm -hmm. I'm a father of three daughters, so huge respect to you, for you. <laughs> <laughs> I stopped at three. <laughs> and second question, it was actually raised from uh, Julie, 
I read that you are focused in Israeli startups. Yes. And I'm very curious, uh, why not in the neighborhood? You answered partially, but uh, the ecosystem, I'm very, I'm heavily involved with the ecosystem in Cyprus that I'm mm -hmm. working and living the past four years and also in Greece. And now you have the partnership with uh, Viva Investments. So I think there is a huge, huge potential because currently the ecosystem is not so much developed. Of course, the government, and we have Despina here, is uh, very investment pro. But in the same time, um, most of the, of the startups that are mentoring, they're telling me that, and this goes to my second question, mm -hmm. that the investors or the accelerators, or as you want to mention, we don't have any studios. They're asking a very high number of e equity at the beginning. So my second question is what you are asking for someone to enter the studio. Mm -hmm. Cool. But we, so the daughters, the, was not, the, the, the daughters was not a question because I think that's a product. <laughs> you're with. No, it was not a byproduct. Ah, okay, cool. <laughs> the first question is why not Greece why and not Cyprus are there in uh, the neighborhood? And of course, we can help you. So I'll speak quietly so Lee doesn't hear. <laughs> um, one, we're always happy to be involved and support. And definitely, the more touch points we have for our model elsewhere improves our model. So there's a clear interest to do that. Uh, we're currently looking at bringing the studio model into Tokyo. We have a very strong partnership there with some of the mega corporates there. Uh, we're looking into bringing the studio into universities in New York. Uh, so definitely, there's an opening for that. Uh, the only caveat I will, I will, I will say is um, there has to be real readiness and real partnership in order for that to be successful. Because we'll bring the methodology and support its execution, but at the end of the day, if there's not somebody on the ground to really pick it up and really run forward with it, it's going to be very difficult to do because at the end of the day, we are a venture fund in Israel that needs to run fast. Um, so we're looking more on the partnership of how to help others use our model and not investment. From an investment perspective, our deal flow from Israeli startups could fit a fund four or five times larger than us, and it's a very concentrated ecosystem, so a lot of our resources and, and ability to support is there. But one last thing I'll, I'll add to the answer, because I totally forgot the other question, is, uh, is when I was driving a lot of these programs around the world, um, I leaned a lot on the talent from Israel. And one of the things you're gonna learn about Israelis is that they love to travel the world, share knowledge, and work together. So I had different teams travel with me to Mexico, and Lagos, and Singapore, and Tokyo, and wherever I opened programs, I could always lean on the Israeli ecosystem being open, and people you know, would take a week off, unpaid, just to come and help a new ecosystem evolve and learn from it. So being so close, uh, both Greece and Cyprus, it just doesn't make sense that these two ecosystems are not better intertwined, and there's no flow of knowledge, uh, but I would definitely have to follow up with you and see if we can turn that into a reality. That would be amazing. This program can happen also between Greece and Cyprus because they're eager to get out. Mm -hmm. A, a word of caution, don't replicate, build your own. I, I, you know, when I lived in Silicon Valley, it was beautiful because wherever you travel, everybody's like, how can we become Silicon Valley? And I'm like, you shouldn't. Different climate, climate meaning skills, capabilities, needs, scale factors. You gotta build what's right for you, then you'll be successful. If you try to copy somebody else's, which is built on a totally different terrain, that's never gonna work. So I would say there are good things to learn from Israel, good things to improve on. Well, thanks to Julie, I get to be a frequent traveler to Greece. I haven't <laughs> been to Greece in 20 years, and now I know Julie, and I'm here every couple of months. So good. definitely we could follow up on that. It's very good. One last question, then we're going to allow um, Roy to introduce one of his portfolio company's entrepreneurs, please. And introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Lauren, uh, founder of Sweat Booker and Sweat Vacay. And I'm wondering, what's more compelling to and New emerging tech or existing tech and proven business models in underserved markets? Hmm. Um, I guess it's not what we prefer, is how convicted we are on the founders and on the applicability of either 
a new shiny, beautiful new tech that's going to change the world, or the business model that's going to be uh, you know, disrupting an existing uh, market. I would say that if you looked at, I don't know if you, if you looked, uh, really ran really fast on it, but if you saw the slide of all the recent unicorns coming out of Israel, um, at least the ones that we mentioned weren't, hey, we've developed a new model of, uh, I don't know, whatever technology that's going to change the way we work with computers. A lot of them were just business models that have been disrupted. And I think Israel is amazing when it comes to founders building new B2B solutions and basically disrupting existing uh, business models. So both have merits. I would say that we're actually seeing more on the second category than the first. But at the end of the day, it's the founders. And at the end of the day, especially in early stage, you need to see a team before you that things are going to get tough and they're going to fail and things are going to get broken and they'll need to rebuild it. Are these the kind of people that you want to be working with? And maybe that's a good segue to, uh, I lost him, where's Daniel? Where, oh, I had one more quick question. Uh. So fast, I promise. Sure, sure. You know, we, on the slide about due diligence, you were saying, you know, you don't have months anymore to go through this process. Mm -hmm. So how many hours, days, or weeks is your team spending in someone's data room? So we, again, we are able to run a proper, saying it in the British accent because that's where I learned the word from, proper uh, due diligence process in approximately two to three weeks. But that would mean that this is 70 to 80% of the attention of the team at that time uh, because we have to, not because we want to. So we're now looking at a company. We had a meeting with them last week. Uh, we have five of our uh, you know, professional experts around us interviewing them in the next couple of days. We're doing all the checks and all the valuation and all the assessment to be ready um, a little bit more than a week from now to make a go-no-go -no -go decision and maybe serve them with a term sheet. That's a speed we have to operate in. Um, but two things. One, you have to be really focused, meaning don't waste your time on every opportunity that you get at this speed. You have to be smart enough and have enough triggers to say, hey, I'm committing the time. And at the same time, when you commit, you commit. Another question, please, for Roy. Please, Malcolm. Yeah? And you said something about the financial returns you're getting. Mm -hmm. um, what about uh, in terms of numbers of startups? So you had a, 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 like a clock of four steps. From 100 going in at the beginning, how many come out as a successful? We're hoping, we're hoping to a portfolio of 14 to 15 companies, mm -hmm. not more, uh, because we work very closely with each one of them. And we anticipate, actually it's an old slide, we're actually looking at a deal flow of about 1,000 startups a year that uh, we get access to, especially through the studio. Um, but we really very aggressively target our portfolio to be split between unicorns, very good deals and not so great deals and not cut a lot of them off because we're just waiting for that one or two to win. So if you want the precise numbers, I'll give them to you in six to eight years. Uh, but they look very promising as they are today. Um, and because we are very much invested in these companies and working with them, we believe that as I've showed in the success metrics of studios, we'll be able to deliver on value on mo most, if not all of these portfolio companies that we're bringing in, even if we'll have to pivot, change, adapt, and make sure that they got the right support along the way. Please join me in thanking Roy Glasberg. That was fantastic. Very good. Thank you.